Calvin, an ex-cult member, to learn the truth about being born into a cult alongside his 44 siblings, the terrifying red flags that he started noticing, and what it took to actually escape this cult. I think I subconsciously feel guilty when I'm making money. Why did they not celebrate holidays in the group? With everything that you did, you always had an alibi. They don't even tell the kids who their mom is. 30 minute conversation with an apostate could make you lose your soul. There is something that is different about choosing a person, mm -hmm. not just being given a person. You're acting like a monogamous. Monogamy oh. was like a curse word. I had a crush on a girl. No! <laughs> That's like ripping your heart Oh my out. gosh! <laughs> This is so good. I'm so glad you're bringing this up. <laughs> I think everything should be fine. Sweet. Okay. I'm with Calvin Wayman. He has been on Smosh's YouTube channel. That's where I come from. He's ran two marathons in a row. Here goes. Also, he is an author of two books and a public speaker. 44 brothers and sisters. 44 siblings he grew up with. So this is going to be really fun to dive All into and talk house. about it. Yeah, all in the same house. That's what's unique and very different from the group that I came from. So, Calvin grew up in a similar polygamous group as the one that I left, but we want to start with talking about the name. What was the name that you just went by and was there multiple names at all? Yeah, so the church that I was in is known as The Work. It's a fundamentalist Mormon church. A lot of people have heard of Mormonism. There's also what is known as Mormon fundamentalism. Mormonism was founded by this guy, Joseph Smith. One of the things that Joseph Smith was notorious for is he was a polygamist. There was a small group of people within the Mormon church that felt that polygamy was a divine sacred thing that they should practice and so they continued to live it and they lived it privately in this underground kind of movement. Yeah, for some reason, fundamentalist Mormonism, because my church and the FLDS church, Warren's church, that everybody everybody knows Warren Jeffs, like mm -hmm. they were once the same church. And that's interesting, because I know the order goes by like, uh, there's four names technically that they use, because I, I think it's to confuse people. They don't On like purpose. people. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. And so, kind of like you guys have changed like your mom's names. Yeah, yeah, see, the, they, the, they just get really into it to make it super hard to pinpoint like the exact church and who's associated with what, you know? And so the, it, the way they kind of use it is the order is only used by members themselves. They like oh. never use it on their websites. They never use that name anywhere else. But like if you're an order member talking to an order member, then you reference to it as the people as the order. That's the group. But the website is the Davis County Cooperative Society. Yeah. So that's like the public name I guess they yeah. use but then the like vice and the news all reference to the group as the Kingston polygamist cult you know yeah and so it's like they have the um, social media name they have the website name the um, name within them and then the business corporate name that they use is the LD uh, latter-day Church of Christ they have the abbreviation for it but they use the Latter-day Church of Christ for like tax write-off purposes mm -hmm. to show that they are a religious group and I guess they can like write off a lot of their taxes or not have to pay as many mm -hmm. taxes or something. Which is interesting because that means it's technically a public church so people could essentially visit it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how all that would work out but yeah. they're supposed to be able to which is really weird. I could go but there. It, in this, I, I yeah. suppose <laughs> I would imagine that's how it's supposed to be if it's a public church and they are able to get you know the church tax write-offs and yeah. things like that for being a, a religious group I guess yeah but, but yeah so it's just I thought it was really weird and growing up it even took me a while to realize that because all I knew is the as the order uh -huh. and then when I saw the website I knew okay obviously there's another name and then when I would talk to outsiders and and see like on the news and stuff it was another name I was like what in the world did but, you guys think that you were the only uh, I know we'll get to that but did you think that you were the only true church left was it kind of taught mm -hmm. that what about the, because I did want to talk a little bit about the names then, because uh -huh. I know in the order we use fake names and stuff. Does your name like come from somewhere? Is it like a My specific actually, family name? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's some, there's a tradition somewhere in fundamentalism where the last name would be changed to, to change the scent of the state so that they could not find who, whose kid was whose to, so that, because polygamy was illegal and mm -hmm. so they would try to to make so that these children had a different last name than the actual dad. 
Mm-hmm. So and so Wayman's probably not your dad's name. It actually is. So I was oh, just okay. gonna say it, that happened, but rarely. One of my moms has a fake name, fake last name, and then mm-hmm. the rest are a true name. However, every single one of my siblings took the last name Wayman. All oh. of them. So every single one of my siblings, like they could all be traced to my dad. Interesting. Yeah. Even though the wives don't necessarily, then right? All of the wives. Um, yeah, all the wives kept their maiden name, and only mm-hmm. one of them has a fake one. Okay. Yeah, huh. so it's interesting. And then my name, I'm named after my grandfather. Uh, I have a grandfather named Calvin Nielsen. Oh, my dad cool. also likes to say there's this, like, one of the fundamentalist founders around the same time that your church started was a guy named Lauren Woolley. Mm-hmm. His middle name was was had a C. He, he went by Lauren C. Woolley, and C stands for Calvin. Okay. So cool. he was like, that's who you're named after, too. So, nice. Yeah. Yeah, I'm actually named after my great-grandpa, Eskel. And the name Eskel comes from Norway. It's a Norwegian name. Mm-hmm. It might be the Norwegian translation of Ezekiel. I'm not sure, mm-hmm. but a lot of people think that that's the case. I just need to do more research. Yeah. But if your church does like record keeping. Yeah, they're, they're really big into that. that's a big thing in Mormon culture for some mm-hmm. reason. Yeah, yeah because it's like, if your name is on their records or in their list, like you might not get to go to heaven. And stuff, I know, you know? isn't that so, interesting? Yeah. You know, like there was this whole conversation that angels were like note taking, record taking, and it's honestly what ended up screwing Warren Jeffs in a big way because they were such record keeping. So when they took all this stuff out of the temple, like they were they able to, found a lot of information. Yeah, like that. who was married to who and all these different oh, things. Wow. Like, yeah, I find it interesting that Mormons of all kinds do that. You have to be connected to your priesthood head, your file leader, and be in this bubble. And if you go into the outside world, then at, at the best, you're in danger mm-hmm. of losing your soul. Well, what about your siblings? What was okay. your, because you had so many siblings. And uh-huh. I, I love telling people that I had 32 siblings and that was a lot. And you even had more than that. 32 is so not a small number. Yeah, yeah. But we still, we had three different houses though. Okay. So at least we had that separation. Yeah. I can't imagine 44 kids in one yeah. house. Was the house like massive or? What was that like? It, it was. Um, it depends on what time period. When I was okay. younger, we, it wasn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we built a massive addition. Okay. So wow. like, did you guys course. do like the construction yourself and stuff? Of or? course. Yeah, that's, that's what, pretty common. That's what fundamentalist Mormons do. Is mm-hmm. they they uh, they're like builders. We're like worker bees. So yeah, like our, our family built the house. Everybody worked on it from the framing, the concrete, the bricking. Yeah, everything. It was like a big family ordeal. Okay. I think there's like uh, 12 bedrooms, 12 bathrooms, something like that. Like it's a pretty nice size house. Nice. Thank you. That's cool. And then what about, what was it like um, interacting with all of those siblings? Like, did you get along? Did you guys fight a lot? Did you guys just always work? All of the above. Um, we got along often, but it. I've been trying to reflect on it and seeing like how to describe the the dynamics because the mm-hmm. one thing I do know I can say for sure it was not like a typical family dynamic like there are sibling sibling wars and rivals rivalries in some families but then like but then it's like coming together as like family I don't know if I ever mm. if, if I ever maybe some of my other siblings felt differently than me and I'm sure they did but I never felt like the the full like we're a family feeling that I see a lot of families have like just closeness. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the reason is, is in my religion, um, something that was incredibly frowned upon was jealousy. Okay. Jealousy was like the worst thing you could have. It was like shove it out and whatever. So because jealousy was bad, favoritism was also bad because if Mm -hmm. you had favorites, then that would mean you're being making somebody else jealous but it would also be what the for whatever reason we use the word you're acting like a monogamous instead <laughs> of a polygamous like monogamy wow. was like a curse word in my That's family so crazy. and so if like don't just give one of your siblings a popsicle. If you're gonna give one popsicle, you better have enough for everybody that's there. Like, mm. so now what? Now I bring all this up because I think it can explain the dynamic. You can't have deep relationships with that many people. Mm-hmm. So what ended up happening in my case, it seemed like, is I had a lot of 
fair, I, had, I had equally shallow relationships. Okay. It's kind of what it felt like. And then what I think is also interesting with the dynamics, but we still were really close. Like my brothers and I worked together, planted the garden together, uh, tended the garden, and, and animals. I played like when I was like a super young and, and teenagers, like played guns with my mm -hmm. brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. basketball, skated, we had a pretty big yard. And, nice. But the dynamic between siblings and parents also wasn't normal, like it wasn't a regular parent-child relationship. It's kind of mm -hmm. like if they were like the police to the citizens, uh -huh. like okay. keeping track of us and making sure that nobody is getting caught, like we would look out for each other to make sure we could do things behind the parents' back, mm -hmm. like sneaking out of the property because we're <laughs> in this fake, fake fenced yard. And yeah. like we were, I was homeschooled, so I almost never left the property my entire upbringing. <coughs> Unless I was like going to work and stuff like that, certainly not unsupervised. So it's, I think at the time I, I thought I was being so bad. I thought I was being <laughs> so naughty when I was like a teenager to sneak out of the yard and like mm -hmm. uh, ride a bike down to Wendy's and mm. get burgers for my brothers and I and then ride back. Like that was bad. Huh. And so that's kind of the dynamic, like, and it was strange. Like I remember, um, I had to sneak to mow someone's lawn because, similar to consecration uh -huh. in the order, we tried to do something like that within families. Okay. <coughs> like you could only mow your family's lawn. No. Then? What? What do I? What do you do with money in the order? You turn it all in. Yeah. To the like the kingdom. Yes. yes. So what do you think we did if we had money? What were you supposed to do with it? If we did it with give it to the church then. Kind of. We gave it to our dad. Oh, okay. If Let's you kept that. money, you were considered like you're out of line. Oh. Like, so it was strange. Like, in fact, I really think, because I'm like, in my a career, in my adult life, I, I think I subconsciously feel weird sometimes at this, like almost guilty when I'm making money. It's so weird huh. because whenever I made money when I was younger and I kept it, it was selfish because I was supposed to give that to my dad. How, how far? Like, was there a certain age where that changed or just did it not matter? It the depended age? on the family. Um, hmm. because there was kind of a debate. People would say, uh, when a boy's 18, he doesn't have to give his money to his dad anymore. Okay. But then people would say, well, if he's still living at his dad's house, he is. Give the money still. Mm -hmm. And then some people would still say is, if he's out of the house but he's not married, he should still give it to his dad. And like, it would be this thing like in in my upbringing like my dad and my grandfather who was one of the church leaders they really believed that boys were never going to not be connected to their dad even when they were married like they're, okay. you're connected to your father forever it's kind of strange so do you feel like that made you better at like budgeting your money or was that made it harder for you to way harder way because harder. you okay. didn't because you didn't you didn't use money mm -hmm. like really yeah, I don't think it made good habits early on. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I had to break out of the, the bad habits because, you, yeah, you just, you weren't encouraged. You weren't encouraged to, like, go make a lemonade stand and create it. Like, we would still do stuff to earn money. Like, in the autumn time, we would chop down the corn stalks and go sell it door to door. Just, like, okay. as a Halloween decoration or pumpkins. Mm -hmm. And that was, that would be considered, like, uh, like, it, like, that we would go do all that, but then turn the money into our dad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I feel like that's a little different than in the order. They were very strict about like where your money was and stuff. But I remember sometimes getting to keep small amounts of money, like in my room or something, as long as I gave ten percent to the church. So uh -huh. like we would even go to the the storehouse. We would give our like hundred dollars to them, and then they'd give us ninety back because the ten percent. Uh -huh. So as long as every single time you ever got money, you gave it to them, so they could take the ten percent, and then you could you could at least debate with your dad where it would go or what you could spend it on, kind of type of thing. Yeah. We always did have to get permission from our parents to take money out of the bank or sure. anything like that. But I think they were a little more lenient, so long as they always got the ten percent went yeah. to the church. So yeah. I think that was kind of their guideline anyway. Um, what about, so going back to like the relationships, yeah. it was very rare we would give hugs or things mm -hmm. like that. 
Was it like I would almost never hug my siblings? Was that similar with you guys, or totally. was that like never? Yeah, hugged it siblings. felt weird, huh? Yeah, I would wrestle and <laughs> fight them, but mm-hmm. not hug them. I know. And then um, so crazy. my relationship with my dad, when I was super young, like he, my dad has always been super great with kids. Mm-hmm. Like he has a great connection to kids, and when I was a kid, like I had a great relationship with him. But I mean, you know this. Like <laughs> we were talking about this yesterday. Your dad in fundamentalist Mormon culture, like is kind of your the gatekeeper of your soul of your advancement like he has to recommend for you to Mm -hmm. get the priesthood and and move on and so as i grew older like probably eight years old and and beyond certainly in my teens that relationship dynamic completely changed Mm -hmm. because you're kind of you're kind of walking on eggshells you 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 want to make sure that you you're being seen in the very best light so that he can pass you off and recommend you to the priesthood brethren, the, the, the church leaders. Okay, what about like punishments then? Cause was, I remember feeling a lot of a fear-based type of relationship with my dad <coughs> because my mom, and this might be unique to my family only, but my mom was af- almost afraid of disciplining the boys. She would discipline uh-huh. the girls, but whenever I would get in trouble, she would be like, wait till your dad gets home and basically tell him how many spankings I needed or things like uh-huh. that. And so I, a lot, oftentimes I felt more like, oh, dad's coming home, like I'm gonna receive my punishments. Like uh-huh. it was a, a more of a fear type of thing. Uh-huh. Was there anything like that with your family? Or? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Totally. I don't even know how far we want to go down that rabbit hole, but yeah, like, uh, yeah, my family, like, when I'm doing comedy, I have this joke uh, to try to make light of some of the stuff that happened in my upbringing. I was like, uh, let's just say that my fa- every family expresses love differently, and let's just say that my family's love language was physical touch. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I'm just gonna, yeah, so, oh, yeah, so there was definitely, there was definitely punishment, um, prim- some, from all my parents, but primarily my dad. Mm-hmm. Like, he definitely, like, if we got out of line, it was just very common to get your ass kicked or punched or something like that, depending on the, the severity of the crime. Okay. And committed. True. Now, um, was it different? Because I know a lot of these groups are very sexist. Was it very different what, like, the girls would get punished versus the boys and things like that? <clears throat> yeah. I, my sisters have definitely, definitely still got punished in some ways similar to the boys. Mm-hmm. Um, they were treated differently mm-hmm. in some cases. Like, for some reason, my sisters were always hounded for how they looked and dressed. Oh yeah, I remember them. that. What, for sure. Like if they had their hair hanging, it was a big deal. Um, mm-hmm. Anything like that, but yeah. What about? I did want to talk about the modesty. Then, what were some of the like extreme? Because you know how there's always like the guidelines these churches will give, and then there's like the Molly Mormon uh, mm-hmm. expectation. That's not like a commandment or anything, but like people go above and beyond. <coughs> what were some of those lines in your group? Well, for guys, long sleeve shirts. Always. Long pants, okay. always, even in the winter or even in the summer. Mm-hmm. And wear, because we're trying to cover the, the garments, the long underwear. Mm-hmm. And for women, uh, dresses no matter what. Yeah, I even, one thing that really surprised me is I remember going into the creek and like visiting some distant cousin of ours we were supposed to go help and we happened to drive by a swimming pool in the community and they were jumping in with their full on shirts mm-hmm. and, and full on dresses. The girls were swimming with a dress on and I was like, that's totally. gotta be so hard. <laughs> totally. And see, that's even like they are being rebellious almost getting in water at least. Really? Yeah, because I grew up being taught that I couldn't get in a swimming you pool. You can't swim? Yeah, what? because because the water was controlled by the devil for some reason. And really? so I grew up never really swimming, and t- but as I got into a teenage, teenage years, I wanted to. So I would do the same thing, okay. get in water in my full freaking clothes. I ended up getting uh, a full wetsuit so that I could be fully covered and still have my long underwear on and I would go, I, like, if I, if, if I, if I was going to go to a, like a, a, a swimming pool, mm-hmm. then I would wear that full wetsuit. And it's crazy oh. as I'm reflecting back on this because I remember thinking there's like this water park in Draper here mm-hmm. and uh, my cousins worked on it and I worked on it a little bit too. 
Cool. And I remember wrestling with the thought of like, this would be so fun, but it's so bad that there's so many people that <sighs> have their clothes off mm -hmm. and are just wearing trunks or something. Damn. And I'm like, I want to come here, but if I do, I'm going to be wearing my full surf gear. And was that, it would be hard to stand out so much, right? Yeah. That would be so difficult. Dang. Yeah, I, uh, I took a, I ran a race a couple of years ago, a, a triathlon thing that's running, biking, and water, and I did that. Mm -hmm to like force myself to figure out how to swim, so. Oh yeah, if you can't get in water, how did you learn how to swim? I didn't. I, okay. I learned how to swim since leaving the religion a few years ago. Wow. And I, I'm not great at it. Okay. But I did, I did do a race that involved water, so. Okay, I that's survived. cool. I love swimming. Me like, too. When I like went to California, I, jumping in the water. Yeah. yeah that's the coolest Like I, when I lived in California, I almost never got in the ocean. Because mm. I was, it was still when I was in the religion. I was like, mm. I don't know, it's water, <laughs> and because I was conditioned the whole my whole life that water is controlled by the devil. Wow. And then it was, it wasn't until, actually, it wasn't until I left the religion and and went to California and was in California that I'm like, you know, what, I'm just gonna get in. And I was like, I can't believe I went my whole life not getting in the ocean. Like this is crazy. Mm. There's all these little things. It's like. This is this is silly. Like, mm -hmm. This is bananas. I can't believe that we let these beliefs like hold us back from enjoying these simple pleasures. So. Mm -hmm. And how old were you when you left? Almost thirty. Almost thirty. Yeah. Oh, so you spent nearly twenty nine years in the group then. Yeah, an wow. entire life. I lived an entire life. In this new life, I'm a baby. I'm like four <laughs> years old. In this new life. Yeah. Wow, that is so wild. Yeah, so hmm. different. What about um, holidays? Why did they not celebrate holidays in the group? Because they felt that it was some strange pagan uh, Gentile tradition that they did not that we did not want to participate in. So okay. <clears throat> Christmas. Um, I mean, you see it even outside of Mormonism, where people are like it's it's Christmas is too. Uh, yeah, Jehovah's Witnesses don't yeah. celebrate any holidays as well. Yeah, and they're like, Christmas, it, some people are like, it's too commercialized, and I get mm -hmm. that. But they would also say in Mormonism that Jesus wasn't born in December, he was born in April. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So they were like, it's, yeah, so I just grew up never celebrating Christmas. Very rarely right. celebrated birthdays, maybe a cake or a, the family sending a card for you, but never like a full-on like celebration with gifts or any of that. Okay, yeah. so it wasn't necessarily just holidays, there was any type of celebration then? What's strange is there were some holidays that were okay. Really? So, yeah. They would just have to be justified by them kind of? Then? Yeah, so holidays that were okay were like Independence Day, because it's oh. celebrating America, Freedom and so there's that's patriotic. Uh, another holiday that was always celebrated was Thanksgiving. Okay. Uh, that was a big family thing. And never Easter because bunnies don't lay eggs. Like <laughs> that was like uh, I remember my dad getting upset over Easter. Um, and then uh, for some reason, always New Year's. People we would make a big celebration thing. But those were the main hmm. three: Independence Day, Thanksgiving, and New Year's. Okay. So what about you? Say they're very patriotic. Did people ever go in the military or things like that? I mean, my grandfather was in World War Two. Okay, because yeah. he was drafted or something? Yeah, he was drafted. My okay. uncle, one of my uncles was in Vietnam. Oh, you mentioned jealousy. Okay, so mm -hmm. in the order, it's like, I don't know what's the best way to describe this, but you almost always knew who the favorite wife was. And it was Ooh. like a fight to be the number one wife or like whoever they would, the husband would spend the most time at that house uh -huh. or something. Was there, you said it was like really bad to to do that, yes. but did that happen at times, or like was that noticeable? Not that I noticed. My siblings and I would, would suspect that my dad had a favorite in, in the youngest mom, but, okay. but he was big on this. He was like so adamant to make sure that he didn't have favorites. Okay, he was so like, I love you all equally, and stuff like that. Like he detested hmm. any sign of favoritism. Even if I did something nice to one of my own mom's kids, instead of another mom's kid, because that's being monogamous mm -hmm. to your own blood. Like, he was big on my brother, who was the exact same age as me, from another mom, was just as much of my brother as any other sibling from my birth mom. Wow. Like, there's, there, like I did not even learn about this concept of half 
mm -hmm. sibling until after, like until my 20s. And wow. even then when I was learning about it, there was a debate within my family that's like, you, you don't look like a, did somebody saw you in half? Like you don't look like a half sibling. Mm -hmm. Like you're a, you're a sibling. And we would like make fun of anybody that uses the term half sibling. Interesting. Yeah. It was all, you were all the same. You were, you're, a, you're a full sibling. It doesn't matter which mom you came from. And some families take it to so much the extreme where they don't even tell the kids who their mom is. Whoa. And they consider that like a virtuous thing. Like huh. this child doesn't even know. Wow. That is very different. I know in, at least within my family, like we knew who was with who and like, and there was a lot of like jealousy, like, oh, our family's better or whatever and stuff like that. Even to the point that like, I think to me, the only reason why I knew there was a favorite wife is because it, he would end up being at that home a lot more. Uh -huh. And it was like, obviously if you're here more than once every three days, then something's off, you yeah. know? And so were they really strict about like how much time he could spend with, I guess if it's all in the same house it's though, same that's house. different. Huh. It's all in the same house because we okay. all ate together, we all had breakfast together, okay. all had dinner together, all had family prayer at night together, we wow. had Sunday school in my dad's house, had like family home evening. What, but wouldn't that be so hard to be like punctual with all these kids and all these families? Wouldn't that be... You're saying all these families, it's one family. That's true. 44 so, kids. <laughs> and so, um, but there was structure. Uh, whenever it was time for dinner or whatever, like, there was like this, this common call was like a whistle. <laughs> like okay. my dad or one of my moms would like whistle. <laughs> and that whenever you heard the whistle, you get running. And wow. if you didn't come to the whistle call, then you're going to get your ass kicked, <laughs> especially if it was my dad, like, and <laughs> don't walk, you run to the sound of the whistle. Like, uh -huh. so th like, that's, like, it was controlled. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of us. It's probably like herding cats. So, uh, yeah. So at dinner time, we were all there. We would, uh, sometimes we would sit there and my dad would be like, where's so-and-so? Where's Violet? You know? And like, we'd all have to wait until they came so make sure we're all there and that sort of so thing. So everyone would kind of nudge each other to make sure they're all there. Kind totally. Of, right? okay. Yeah, totally. That's another thing is there's this, it starts to be this, uh, the group polices itself. Mm -hmm. You're going to do this or else father's going to be mad. So mm -hmm. you'd get like social pressure to do the, the right thing. What about though, I oftentimes felt this dynamic where it was kids versus parents totally. a lot of the times. So like, totally. would there be kind of like riots amongst the si the kids against the parents ever, or like how would that go? Yeah, like always. Again, it kind of makes <laughs> it kind of makes me feel like almost like a town, or like and the police. Mm -hmm. Like that's what it felt like. <laughs> oh like, yeah. And so we were always doing stuff behind the parents' back or mm -hmm. sneaking uh, to go play guns even something mm -hmm. as simple as that like down at the barn area because you're not supposed to play around the barn area and stay mm -hmm. close to the yard or uh sneak into the school room and play the computer early in the morning <laughs> and again like watching for each other so that the parent doesn't mm -hmm. get caught or the, so that a parent doesn't catch you mm -hmm. like it was and yeah it was interesting that way um i remember though feeling like i'm for some reason when i was like an early teenager, I remember feeling bad that, this is a strange feeling, I remember feeling bad that other kids didn't get a habit how I had it, like where you could get caught by a parent, because that to me was fun. It was fun. Oh. It was like an adrenaline rush that I'm mm -hmm. like, that makes it part of the fun to go sneak off at the end of the yard and play guns with your siblings. and. Part of the fun is that if a parent catches you, you're toast. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, if you just got to do this whenever, that wouldn't be as fun. Yeah, there's a certain amount of adrenaline that comes yeah. from that excitement. Yeah, for sure. I remember, I don't know why, but I had that thought when I was like 12 or 13. Nice. I remember, I, I mean, maybe this was unique to me, but like, did you ever feel sometimes that um, when you would get like punished or things like that, it really wasn't that bad because you were just so used to it. Oh yeah. Like punishment, sometimes it would be like, okay, let's just get this over with type of thing. Oh yeah. yeah. Kick my butt, whip my butt, 
punch me, whatever, and it's mm -hmm. like, okay, it's done, great, that was easy. Yeah, that's one thing I have such a hard time with. When I talk with people that don't understand what it's like, they're always like, feel so sorry for me, or yeah. like, that must have been so hard. But it's like, when that's all you know, totally. it's very, it almost seems like it was easy, because it's just, you're just used to that as a way of life, and so you just brush it off very easily. Totally. Whereas someone that's not used to getting those punishments all the time, them getting it probably would be very dramatic and just yeah. crazy. But for Did me, it just felt very normal. Do you know if it taught you to, to lie? Because that's what I know that it did to my me and my siblings. I think the way, because the punishment was so harsh, the unintended consequence is we all got really sneaky. We okay. got really good. Like, whenever we got in trouble, it wasn't like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. It was like, oh, I got to do better next time. With get so I don't get caught. Yeah, that'd be better. With I felt like I need to be more like secretive and like yeah. um, keep things. But I had the hardest time lying. I remember it was such a guilt thing that I was like, I if I, I was looking in my parents' eyes, totally. they could get anything out of me. I totally, swear. totally. <laughs> so the way I did it to get over that is I would I would say things that were true, but were there was added on. So for example. Mm -hmm. um, if I wanted to sneak out of the house, say I got really smart that the best time to sneak was in broad daylight. So huh. instead of like leaving, I would tell my dad, like let's say I wanted to go sneak off with my cousin and okay. like go get a little Caesar's pizza and hang out of the park. Mm -hmm. I would tell my dad, I have a video that I need to go drop off at the library. I did, mm -hmm. but I really wanted to go hang out with my cousin Richard. That's really okay. what I was. So you, you always had an alibi. With everything that you did, you always had an alibi why you were doing something. So if you did get caught and everything, then then I could also say I technically wasn't lying. Mm -hmm. You know. I see. Yeah, that's true. So it made it you get a lot more like clever, kind of than huh? totally. I can definitely see that. That's really cool. Yeah, I, it wasn't until I was like 19 and I was hanging out with some of my distant cousins and saw that it was like around Halloween and. My parents, this was one of the rare times that my parents had no idea I was out. And, and I was at their house with their dad. And he was like, okay guys, have fun, I'll see you in the morning. And I remember being so dumbfounded and confused, like, wait, he's gonna let us just go to this Halloween party and he's not gonna wait up for us and like, hmm. like look, because like, cause we were so supervised all the time mm -hmm. all the way until 19 or 20. wow yeah i remember feeling very restricted like if i would ask to go to even like my half siblings houses and they would want to know how long what i would be doing there all these things but like if they let me then it was almost like a golden ticket because there were so many other kids that if i got that ticket to leave it's like they would almost forget about me and i could just disappear uh, for a little I while and stuff that. yeah you know, i remember yeah. craving and I think this is one of the reasons I loved college. Is college was my first time I got to <sighs> <laughs> breathe because I w I wow. felt so, and and it and, and some of this I didn't even realize it was more of a subconscious feeling mm -hmm. because it was all I knew it was what it was normal. But like I now know that like humans need to have room to grow and develop. But oh, like yeah. subconsciously, like I wanted to like have some breathing room and it wasn't mm -hmm. until like I went to college where I was like okay I get to be by myself I don't have my parents checking in on me like every hour mm -hmm. you know wow. and now I was not doing stuff that was my own thing mm -hmm. so. that's really cool dang okay now I want to get a little bit more like personal okay and so if any of them if you want to like pass the question or anything feel free sounds good but what about like your very first crush within the group what was that like ah this is so good I'm so glad you're bringing this up <laughs> oh man the first crush okay this is a big deal because in fundamentalist Mormonism you're taught that you're that you had covenants in mm -hmm. the previous existence for this person that you're marrying Mm -hmm. <coughs> and anything romantic related in these groups is like the biggest deal ever. It's such they a big put deal. so much emphasis on it. It's crazy. Yeah, and I was so curious, like, who's God have for me? And I had a crush on a girl, mm -hmm. and I, I knew that we were supposed to get married. <laughs> Dude, this was wild. So I'm like, I think I was like 17 or 18. And we were doing uh, like this church-sponsored program, 
mm -hmm. where we were like singing and she was in it too and I got these major like butterflies like it was every time we went to practice we Aww. started talking more <laughs> and we start like having good times and then it's getting close to where the performance is gonna happen like a week or two away it's like this is gonna end this is this wild night and we're talking more and I'm like holy crap she like she feels the same way too like and I'm like we're gonna get married like we're meant to be together how old were you eight 17 or 18 oh so that's pretty old then okay. yeah yeah oh. Um, but this was the first time I did something like because I was homeschooled. Mm -hmm. Keep that in mind. So this was like the first time doing something outside of my own um, mm -hmm. home. <coughs> and then um, I remember. I mean, I had other crushes, but this was my first serious one where I was like, "This is the one I'm gonna marry." She came she, like one time after practice. We were gonna be practicing the next day, and she says, "I want to talk to you before before practice tomorrow." Ooh. And my whole day, I'm going to work, and I'm on like cloud nine. Like I just oh, know, man. I just know she's gonna come say that she thinks she's supposed to marry me too, and Dang. we go, uh, we kind of sneak off, but where everybody else isn't. Uh, before singing practice the next day and we're just sitting down she's like I have to tell you something and I just like this is a big moment and I'm like oh, yeah. holy crap my heart is so big I'm like she's gonna say it because obviously we've been getting closer mm -hmm. and she said so I noticed we've been talking and I think there's something for me I'm like yeah yeah and she said so I need to tell you and I'm like yeah she's like, I think I'm supposed to marry someone else. <gasps> no! That's like ripping your heart Oh my out. gosh! <laughs> you have no idea to a fundamentalist boy oh. that thinks that God gave you this and it was like, what? Like, my world crashed down. Mm -hmm. Like, it was like, what? Like I had this fantasy created like for like two months, like mm -hmm. every day and we're getting closer. And, and it's like, you have this purse, like you, you knew in the previous existence and this is what it is and holy oh, crap. It's dude. such a big deal in those groups, man. Such a big deal. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Dang, I know that exact feeling though, because I just remember like, when you even just had a little crush on someone, it's, it was such a big deal. Like yeah. I was scared to tell people about yeah. it. Like it was nerve wracking. Oh man, so to have her tell you mm -hmm. no basically yeah. before anything even really happened. I know. So. It's just like there's this like a feeling and she tells me she's supposed to that she thinks she's supposed to marry somebody else. And, oh, oh man. <laughs> wow. <coughs> that is so funny. Yeah. <laughs> Dang. And then so you were eighteen though. That is that's still I feel like I mean I remember being a lot older. I had little crushes that like never amounted to anything. But I do remember when I was 12, for some reason, I had this conversation with another boy in my group, and he was all like, uh, I know of like people that have gotten married at 14, so we have like two years to get married. <laughs> like, <laughs> thinking stuff like that. You know, from very young, it's like getting married was like your biggest goal, and it meant everything. Yeah, so, I was so, planning on getting married when I was 21. Like, she was okay. like, yeah, that'll be perfect. 21 yeah. okay yeah that like so I, so I'm like I know now God's letting me know now so that we can get to know each other for three years <laughs> this is great nice wait get to know each other for three years that's a lot that? that, like that's very rare yeah because as soon as you tell get told the person you're gonna marry then you, you get married like, so fast yeah, like right immediately mm -hmm. like a week two weeks yeah, yeah. I remember that. like engagements in the order if it was more than a couple weeks they would like question you and like wonder what's going yeah. on yeah <laughs> and so in, in the work they'd be like if you had a long engagement they're like it's it's creating space for the devil to come in and, mm -hmm. and ruin so, it yeah. and stop you from having more kids yeah, and when, stuff. when God gives you the appointment, you just do just the appointment. Do yeah, mm -hmm. that's so crazy. Dang. Yeah, I definitely had crushes when I was like twelve, and mm -hmm. again thirteen. The reason I tell you this story is that's the most that's dramatic. The one, huh? That's the most okay. dramatic. Like I think I, that has affected me in my dating life now. <laughs> like, <laughs> like Dang. probably somewhere deep inside there. Like. Like I don't know, I probably have this like uh, abandonment wound of like <laughs> the girl, the girls I love, I really love that are gonna like Just pull the rug out from under me or something. Uh, but no, I've had, dude. Honestly, dating has been one of the m most amazing. Like I can't believe I almost went my whole life without, without dating. dating, dude. Yeah. Like the like it doesn't mean all that's been good. Mm -hmm. Like 
it's been horrible, but great because mm -hmm. you learn so much yeah. about yourself and humans mm -hmm. just just engaging and getting close to another human being. And I've mm -hmm. had some pretty amazing relationships too with amazing women. Yeah. Um, and I think some of the joy comes from that adrenaline of not knowing what's going to happen, what it's going to be like, and it being so new. I remember feeling that when I first started dating. <coughs> it was like a world of a difference. Yeah, and to me there's, there's like in the work, for anybody that doesn't hasn't picked this up yet, the work has like arranged marriages. Mm -hmm. So there are things that you miss when you are developing re your your almost like your relationship capabilities. Mm -hmm. In the work, you you don't. I mean, your marriage is probably going to be horrible if you're not that way. But I know people that don't have great marriages mm -hmm. because they never had to do that. Oh, like yeah. they they never had to. They never had a girl dump them because they didn't take a shower for like. A week. Mm. Or even further than that, I, I feel like a lot of the times in these groups, the men almost feel like they're taking on like this little girl, where it's not like an equal relationship, it's more totally. like, I, I have you. the and, and I have the priest and I'm doing you this favor, mm -hmm. that you get to be my wife or be part of my family. Yeah. I remember one time in the group when a girl had come to me, and I was only like 15 or 16, but she was like, I had a dream that we got married. Mm -hmm. And in the group, dreams are like direction from God, uh -huh, you know? Uh -huh. So I remember that being such a big deal and crazy. And like I was like scared basically for some reason. Uh -huh. And it was just crazy how it all You make out, me but. think of a story. There was a girl that liked me when I was 15 or 16. And this just shows how much pressure there was. Some She said something that showed others in my family that she liked me. And my oh. older siblings like ripped like I like got in trouble, I'm like because of what she did. Because she did. said something that mm. made it sound like that that she liked me. Mm -hmm. So she was like, they're like, do you have a girlfriend? Do you have a girlfriend? <laughs> and like that was she, the worst thing ever. <laughs> she said something, something so simple. It was something like she had a nickname for me, huh. and uh, it was like. Why did she call you that? Is she your girlfriend? And it's like a, a bad thing. And I was like, like no, like I like it's crazy. Like any girl I talk to from 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, like all the close female friends that I had in the religion, like I had to be sure that like they're not my girlfriend. They're not my girlfriend. They're not. And my you girlfriend. couldn't show any type of lovey dovey stuff at all. Not at all. Right? And mm -hmm. some of them I wanted to. I was very mm -hmm. much attracted to several of them. And. Um, had to keep saying like, nope, nope, we're not, we're not. And like, because if you do, you're doing a very bad thing. Mm -hmm. Like I remember hanging out with this chick and I wasn't young, I was like 19 or 20. I think I was even in college. <laughs> and we're in the creek, hanging out in her Jeep. Hmm. And we're just hanging out and talking. And then we see my dad in his truck. And I think her dad was in his truck too for some reason, they were like friends. And both of us, just by instinct, like, like just ducked, and we're like hiding. It's like ten thirty at night, and this is so because we're not twelve. Well, we're you're like, not even making out or anything. No, right? like, nothing at all. Yeah, but it's still the worst thing like, you could possibly. Like, do. it's just so strange. <laughs> like, I'm a twenty year old guy, and we're like hiding from mm -hmm. our parents because. We're friends, but we can't let them know we're friends. Mm -hmm. But here, but here again. But I policed myself. Like that relationship, for example, the one, like that could have turned into something. Mm -hmm. But we were. I, I was so like determined that I was not going to kiss someone until oh, I was yeah. married, and and I wanted to have the one that God gave me. And maybe you're the one that God gave me, and if you are, then we're going to get married. So I'm just going to wait. Yeah, you were yeah. such a good member, I feel like. <laughs> that is wild. I remember feeling those same feelings. I haven't had my feelings <clears throat> until I was 21. And then I, that was, and I had well, left I the was, group and everything. I was almost 25. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went all through college, like resisted, and yeah, I made the decision I wasn't gonna, yeah. So like, like, that was so big for me. I guess uh, I want to say like when did you finally have it, but it was probably when with your arranged marriage, right? Was your first kiss? Or? Yeah, that's when okay. I first my first kiss. But there's a lot of other experiences that I've had since leaving, for mm -hmm. sure. Okay. That that felt way more like a first because yeah. even mm -hmm. even that like it in some ways it was exciting because like 
oh, you're having your first kiss, but in some ways it's underwhelming because mm-hmm. there is something that is different about <clears throat> about choosing a person, mm-hmm. not just being given a person, going on a date with somebody and like letting the chemistry build and then having a kiss, like that to me is different oh, yeah. than an arranged kiss that mm-hmm. some dude said you guys should kiss. Yeah. Like, it's so <laughs> weird when you really think about it. FLDS, Warren Jeffs, and the work were once the same and then there was a split and they were right by each other. In fact, some people, many people from the work still lived in Colorado City mm-hmm. where Warren Jeffs Church is headquartered, but there was never any interaction with them. And mm-hmm. I, I think a big, I think a big reason for that is we were all scared of each other. That like we were taught that <clears throat> somebody else could make you lose your way that you could mm-hmm. lose your testimony you know like a 30 minute conversation with an apostate could make you lose your entire soul mm-hmm. and they had the same teaching that a conversation with us could lose it now some people i think rebelled against this and like talked to them but mm-hmm. if they're an apostate don't cross the street to say hello to them <laughs> you know like there's this whole saying that we had um, that priesthood is thicker than blood what that meant, priesthood represents the church, it represents the community. That meant if somebody left, that was your own family, your own mm-hmm. brother, they're not really your brother anymore. Wow. Your, your family is the people that are in the religion. Priesthood is thicker than blood. That's so sad. Damn. So sad, yeah. And so I grew up, yeah, thinking that like if you left, you're, you're, you're cutting yourself off and the people that, that leave, they're like, they, they're outsiders now. Like your mm-hmm. own blood siblings or somebody like, they become outsiders. Yeah. When I left, I became an outsider. I remember that being one of the hardest things for me to accept when I was thinking about leaving and preparing to leave. Like it was so hard to think that these siblings of mine that I'm so close with, grew up my entire life with, was so dedicated and wanting like work <coughs> with them and everything that they would just disown me. And a part of me didn't believe it. Mm-hmm. All the way up until I left and came back home and had everything be so weird and mm-hmm. like them basically not feeling welcome there and stuff. Totally. That's when it finally hit me and it just was like heartbreaking. It was really sad. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a strange phenomenon with fundamentalist Mormonism. It's sad. Mm-hmm. And it's on a spectrum. Like some are crazier than others. Like there's like the order and the work and then on the far end of the fundamentalist Mormon spectrum is the Warren is the FLDS Warren's church and like I have friends <coughs> that do that that grew up again in the neighboring cult Warren Jeffs and they have they they haven't been able to talk to their mom for like six years Whoa. because once they left they can't like because they're taught that that again, once you leave, you're, they're now under the influence of the devil. Mm-hmm. When you're in it, you're safe, you're wearing the long underwear, the garments, you're under the direction of, of priest authority, and when you leave, you cannot, you cannot trust yourself. Mm-hmm. Like that's something that's a big thing that's in this. Like you can't trust yourself, you can't trust your intuition, you can't trust your gut. In fact, your whole life is about sacrificing this human body to be like God that's how they Mm -hmm. put it and like sacrifice like the natural man is an enemy to God is something yeah that John Timpson and the other church leaders have said Um, and so it makes you think that you cannot be trusted and you need to like listen to them Mm -hmm. it almost makes it like I mean someone described it as um, don't make the decision for yourself because it might be wrong if you let them make the decision and if it's wrong it can be somewhat their fault you know so yeah, it's like exactly. almost having someone to blame it's yeah kind of silly but it's like it's literally choosing your entire <coughs> fate the, the person you're gonna have your family with the whole career and life you're gonna live you're gonna leave that up to someone else like that's yeah your that's, that's just normal and it's looked at as a noble mm-hmm. thing it's like oh you're doing what god wants for you that's how it was taught is you're doing what God wants. You're getting the blessings that he's given you. You're not seizing blessings to your own. Like that was another thing of how, like, if you went and, if you went and worked your face off to earn money, that's you seizing blessings. Like any form of ambition. They would count is, as like selfish or something. Yeah, right? like that's something that's been weird is I'm, I'm naturally liking, like 
just my DNA. I like to challenge myself and do stuff, and that was considered like. A, yeah, like selfish. Like you can't go get the things you want in this life. You need to be passive and wait until God gives it to you. Oh yeah, this is totally going to change the subject Let's though. Do it. But um, this is something that I feel like in my family it was always super awkward. And it's awkward for like everyone in general. So I want to know what was like sex education like in the church, and did your parents give you the birds and the bees talk? Stay tuned, you guys. <laughs> Sweet. Anything else you want to add? Anything you want to share? He has books too, if you, a children's book if you got kids. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I would just say uh, join the CIA. Consistent and perfect action. That's it. That's the to life. <laughs> nice. I like that. That's awesome. Thanks, bro. Sweet. Yeah. Thanks for letting me do this. I think yeah. this was so fun. Sweet, everyone. Well, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Have a good one. Bye.